Board of Trustees Budget Committee Workshop, April 28, 2020, 1 p.m. here in the Administrative Building, 1900 Price Road, Bronzeville, Texas, 78521. If we can have the Pledge of Allegiance, Ms. Peña, if you can lead us. Thank you, Ms. Peña. I would like to recognize um, my other colleagues that are here, Ms. Drew Brown, Mr. Eddie Garcia, our board president, Ms. Minerva Peña, and of course our superintendent and everyone, Mr. Cowan as well. <laughs> You're sitting so far, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, members of the committee, of the budget committee present, um, Ms. Peña and um, hopefully Ms. Laura Perez Reyes will join us very soon. Our committee goal is to review and discuss the budget preparations elements for the 2021 school year. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Gutierrez. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tipton and uh, members of the budget committee, as well as uh, the rest of the board members. This is our second uh, budget workshop that uh, we're gonna have. We had one uh, earlier this spring semester, and it was about the staff, uh, the salary study that, that was conducted by uh, TASB. And so I wanna thank the board for having approved that, and then we did a presentation, or we had TASB present on that uh, study. And so now we go into the second uh, budget workshop, which is this one, and this one has to do with a staffing uh, study of the school district. These two studies are very critical and important for us uh, as a school district to uh, be able to look at the salaries of all our employees and then be able to also look at all our staffing patterns from campuses to departments before we go into uh, the third budget workshop, which is gonna be forthcoming very soon, where we're gonna start putting uh, numbers together for the budget year for 2020-2021 school year. Uh, Dr. Cantu and um, Mr. Robledo, Mary Garza, they've been already working and putting some uh, budget numbers together based on the, the study that we are about to present and the study before on the, on the salaries. So uh, we are getting there as far as putting a, a, a budget together and uh, based on data, based on information that we have from TASB. And so you're gonna see this as a very informative also study on our staffing and, and where we are as a district because as you all know, our budget is about $500 million as a district, but 75% of that pie is consumed in staff and salaries. So this is the bulk of the budget, and that's why it was important to have these two studies conducted, presented, and then when we meet the third time now, we're gonna look at uh, taking into account both studies and looking at, uh, at where we are as a district as far as uh, monies for next year. But we'll leave that one for the third uh, budget workshop. We leave numbers and, and amounts that, that we have and what we are proposing. Uh, we'll leave it at th for the third budget workshop. What the focus will be here is to look at our staffing ratios across the district and, and look at this comprehensive study that has already been done. It has already been reviewed with uh, me along with the deputy superintendent and the administration. And so we are very familiar with this study already as well as now the board will become familiar with it. And then we will be making those decisions for the third budget workshop based on the on all this information that we have. So I just want you to know this and, 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 and you'll get a very good, complete uh, overview of our staffing patterns throughout uh, BISD. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Trevino so that uh, uh, she oversees the HR department along with Carmelita and her staff. And they've been working with TASB, with Karen Dooley who is gonna be presenting. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to her so that she can uh, give us more information uh, before she starts presenting. Go ahead, Dr. Trevino. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Madam Chairperson, Dr. Tipton, members of the board, Superintendent. It's my pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce Ms. Karen Doodley. She is a senior HR consultant with the TASB. And just to give you a little background, uh, she took multiple months to compile this data. 
she has met with principals. Every principal had an opportunity to sit with her and uh, discuss their patterns and their staffs, uh, as well as any director and central office administrator that she needed to speak to. She had an opportunity to meet with them in the HR conference room. Uh, she looked at PEAM's data as well, and she really evaluated uh, our staffing patterns, like Dr. Gutierrez mentioned, and she's ready to present the findings to you this afternoon. Uh, and comparing it to other districts our size and uh, looking at all the positions, she looked at professional positions, classified positions, and auxiliary positions uh, in order for us to evaluate if we were overstaffed or understaffed, and she's ready to present her findings and her recommendations. Uh, so again, thank you all for the time. Thank you, Carmenita, and your department for ensuring that she uh, had all the resources that she needed in order to present to you actual uh, data that will help you as you make decisions on the budget for next year. So uh, Ms. Doodley, the floor is yours. And you can't be here, but welcome to BISD. This is the best choice. Thank you very much. And can you all hear me OK? Yes. OK. Welcome to my home, <laughs> my office. <laughs> It's good to, to be here with you all today. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my visit when I was there earlier in, in February. Uh, I just happened to be there during a uh, Charo Festival. So I was able to partake in those festivities and thoroughly enjoyed my time when I was there in Brownsville. You just got a, a brief introduction of of kind of what, what I went through and what I did. Um, did a staffing review for you and the process, it uh, entailed data collection. I was able to send out uh, spreadsheets as well as questionnaires to district administrators, campus principals, and collected information from the district and scheduled site visits. Came into the district, did a couple of days of interviewing. Took the data that I received and uh, completed analysis on it. As you were just told, it included peer comparison data where I looked at some peer districts for your districts that were similar in size, similar to demographics, uh, similar to proximity to uh, cities or, or places within the state. Uh, they are statewide peers that we do that for staffing reviews versus what we do for compensation reviews. Our uh, staffing reviews, we use peers from across the state because we're trying to match as closely as we can what your district looks like compared to other districts across the state and, and you know that are very similar. And we get a broader net when we can throw it across the state. We also did some benchmark comparison with data from uh, that we have been that we've established either from association data, uh, for instance, the Texas Counseling Association or the Elementary Principals Association, uh, as well as benchmarks that we established because of looking at data year to year, uh, comparing state averages of different areas across the state. Then what I did was take the district's data and aligned it with the benchmarks, aligned it with the peer comparisons and formed some recommendations by doing so. As was stated earlier, these are just recommendations or just options. You're going to have a menu of items that you're going to be able to look at uh, to address needs that you may have in the school district, especially as you're going through your budget process and obviously our pandemic or COVID-19 is going to cause some uh, probably some unique stress on district budgets as we move forward. And so uh, you are kind of getting some information ahead of having to uh, deal with those challenges. Before I talk about the benchmarking data, I do want to make a couple of notes uh, to make sure that you realize some, a couple of things I did in the report. There is a section on instructional coaches, and I'll be addressing instructional coaches, 
But I want to make sure that you realize that in the report, when I talked about instructional coaches, I compared your district's dean of instruction as the position for instructional coaches. And so I removed that position out of your administrative campus administration benchmark and put it in the instructional coach benchmark, just so you're aware that I did that. Um, that is a dean of instruction, which to me their focus is on instruction. And so therefore uh, it was better, it was easier to compare it to an instructional coach as opposed to leaving it as a uh, campus administrator or assistant principal position. The other thing is custodian. I wanna go ahead and, and let you know this as well. You all have custodians located within the custodial department but then the child nutrition department also has custodians listed. And so I took the child nutrition custodians and included them in the custodial department because they are, their focus is cleaning of the cafeteria and other districts that I, I don't know of any other district that has it separated like that. I always evaluate it as one big group of custodians. And so I just wanna make sure that you know that I have included those child nutrition custodians within the uh, custodial department whenever I am looking at benchmarks. So with benchmarking, the objective of benchmarking is applying uh, concepts that will drive towards the identification of implementation of best practices for the school district. Why do we benchmark? We benchmark to give you a good look at yourself we benchmark to provide a good look at what others are accomplishing with their resources. And then we benchmark to help you prioritize your efforts. What benchmark standards were used in this analysis? We use the comparison to peer districts uh, conducted at a, at a high level using the PEAMS report information, the taper data and the PEAMS standard report data. This comparison uh, is limited, obviously, to positions that are reported in the PEAMS data. A more comprehensive peer comparison has been provided in several areas, included some central office areas, uh, some of the different uh, staff across the campuses as well, some of the departments, uh, for instance, transportation, technology. And we use the TASB HR salary survey data, which is this year's data in 1920, uh, because not only do we collect compensation data when we do the salary survey, but we also collect FTE data, the full-time equivalent, the uh, staff, the position data for those particular positions as well. And we survey about 159 or so uh, positions when we do the salary survey. And then, as I said, we use some state averages and some organizational uh, benchmarking as well. So well, let's not hesitate and let's go on and move into the options. Uh, obviously the report was quite detailed, some 80 pages or so, but what I've done is captured the different options and I'll go through those and under each one you will see bullets and those bullets are actually providing you the information that the recommendation is based on. So to begin with, central administrative staff, I say consider the addition of seven instructional technology specialists. It doesn't have to be that many, but the reason that I got the number seven is because right now the district is staffed with one instructional technology specialist, but the peer district average in this area when using the HR services salary survey data, the district average for the peers was 8.7. So if you were to add seven of those positions, you would be at the eight. Uh, at on target with the peer district average. Now consider too, when we look at these, this is an average across the peer districts. And so you might have some districts that are staffed below the, the eight positions. You're gonna have some that are staffed well above. And when you look at the charts in the report, you will see that sometimes that data is driven or looks like you may need more than you need just because of some outliers in some districts. So keep that in mind when you're looking at, at the data in the report. The curriculum and instruction department employs 2.1 staff 
for 1,000 students compared to 2.3 for the peer district average. And you'll find a lot of times these instructional, instructional technology specialists are located within that department. And so your CNI or academics department is staffed slightly lower than per 1,000 students than your peer district average. If it was my ideal world and I got to choose where to put those positions, if I had eight instructional technology positions, I would place four at the elementary campuses, two at the middle schools and two at your high schools. Okay, central administrative staff. Was I, am I correct? Was I ahead on the chart? I apologize for that. I'm one behind because of the way I'm looking at this. I do apologize. So there's the central, the instructional technology screen. Sorry about that. Now I'm moving to central administrative staff. This is to consider the addition of an HR director. It would mainly be used to uh, be in charge or to oversee or provide oversight of the teacher incentive allotment. I'm sure that y'all have heard uh, information about that teacher incentive allotment through House Bill 3, the legislative uh, recommendation that came, or the, the funds given through the legislator uh, to help with teacher incentives. Uh, y'all already have a couple of campuses that are doing the type, this type of work that I actually got to uh, train with that week that I was in Brownsville. And, uh, you know, that particular endeavor, uh, if you want it to go well beyond those two campuses and in, uh, throughout the whole district at all campuses, it more than likely will require the addition of that HR director. But the good thing is funds you generate or that you get from, uh, from the state for the teacher incentive allotment, 10% can be used for administrative purposes. The next one is campus administration. Consider absorb three secondary assistant principal positions. Many of your campuses were aligned uh, very well with what the uh, benchmark is here, which is one assistant principal per 450 students. As I said, keep in mind, I removed the deeds of instruction out of this. And obviously when I did that, it made most of the campuses on target. Uh, if I would have left those in there, it would have shown that you were above. But as I said, they're deeds of instruction, which they deal with instruction. So to me, they lie closer to instructional coaches because of that. Um, two of these positions are at the, at two alternative, at the alternative campuses. And then one position is at a high school. The district does employ 3.6 positions per 1,000 students compared to the peer district average of 3.4. So you are a little bit ahead of that compared to your peer district averages. And then as well, when you compare it to the one per 450 on the benchmark. The next group we're gonna take a look at are counselors. You can consider the of 27 secondary counselors and three elementary counselors. I hesitate a little bit on this one because of that bullet. Um, Y'all had several positions that were labeled in the system as supplemental counselors. That leads me to believe that there was some intention in the way that y'all staffing your counselors throughout your district. And so obviously, First and foremost, consider what your intentions, intentions are in this area before you would make any changes. The benchmark that I used was one per 350, so one counselor per 350 students. Your total secondary ratio was one to 242.2. So you can see that is where you probably have stacked heavier in counselors is at that secondary level versus at your elementary, which were almost at the benchmark of one to 350, where they were at one to 344.4. Your library staff, you could consider opening oh. the alternate library staffing model. Yes, this we, we, have, a, we model. have a question. Can we ask questions as we go along or are we gonna ask questions yes, at the yes. end? Yes, okay. it, it's, it's really up to you. Okay. Um, going Would back like to the, to the, is it counselor related or? Well, it was. Related? It's actually the last two slides you shared. So basically, you're saying, at two of the 
going back to the APs at two of the alternative yes, I've schools gone back to that slide. Mm -hmm. yeah at two of the alternative schools were over two and one of the high schools were over one and then am I reading this right so you're saying that we should consider absorbing what looks to be 30 counselors 27 secondary and three elementary if you did that that would put you at the one to three fifty benchmark across all campuses. Wow. Okay. As I said, there appears to be some intentional staffing in the area of counselors where it appears that they are deliberately staffed at a higher you know, at a, a greater level than what our benchmarks are. So obviously I would not ever ask you to or recommend you change something if that's a deliberate thing that you've done. Y'all might have a reason outside yeah. of what I'm... I've always benchmarks. heard that we were under on counselors. I mean, I, I, I thought we were always staffing on counselors because we didn't have enough, but this is quite a, a number of counselors. And if, if I may uh, piggyback mm -hmm. on that, uh, and it's true because we've seen, because we need not to forget that we're not dealing with inanimate objects, we're dealing with human beings and students. And, and what we saw was, the need of the counselors to be able to get these children you know to where they need to be so we deliberately made sure that we had the counselors that we needed because we at one point saw the need of them so this is a general study but it's you're not saying this is an exact one shoe fits all this is what's out there this is what you can work with and then we work with what works with the dynamics of our our students and the area that we're at am i correct in saying that Exactly. You've got to look at your pop, your student mm -hmm. population. You have to look at what your identified needs are. You know, you are on the higher side of socioeconomically disadvantaged students versus, you know, a school uh, in another area. And so all of that plays into it. And what type of services are provided in your community versus what types are provided in other communities. So those are all factors that have to be considered when you move forward and make decisions. Now, if you're in cost savings because you're, you know, hitting a brick wall with a budget, then you might look at it as well. Then if you're just wanting to know, okay, where is, where, you know, account for all of your staff, if that makes sense. But you're saying that the benchmark statewide is uh, one for 350 students. And we're yes, that's correct. We're staffed with uh, uh, secondary one for two hundred and forty-two students, and elementary one for three hundred and forty-four. So, if we were to compare ourselves with the rest of the state and the benchmark, we're over quite a bit. Expe yes, especially at the secondary level. But like I said, consider why you are, what you yeah. have in place that they may, may not have in place. But it's been um, a, a constant Chair. mantra that I've heard always that we were, we didn't have enough counselors. And so this is startling to me because that's, yeah. I've heard, I mean, my colleagues, have y'all heard that? I mean, I've always heard well, that, well, that I we didn't a, have enough well, counselors. I have a point I wanted to bring up to you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I would just want to uh, ask you if uh, you consider this. My understanding at the secondary level, uh, you know, you have your normal counselors that are following a class, for instance, but we also have a bunch of other counselors who are specialized, yes. involved in specialties. And how did, did you, I mean, are those 27 that you say that we are over the ratio, is, are they included in the, that number? Yes, yeah. they're all in that number. Your gear up counselors, uh, those supplemental counselors, everybody that a title other than the ones that are specific for grade well, level uh, counselors, and, uh, we're all in. But my question would be, how can you do Project Gear Up uh, without a counselor? And, right, uh, you've got to consider the program. Well, anyway, Karen, Karen, you know. if I may, uh, uh, Dr. Tipton, when it comes to her analyzing all the counselors, she does put them under the same umbrella because when the gear up counselor is working with the freshmen, for example, well, she's working with those kids, so they're, they are taken care of. Maybe she's doing other events and other, you know, field trips or college visits, but she's still working with the kids at that moment. So our ratio as far as working with students is still below, but like she mentioned, that's... A, 
administrative decision if you want to maintain it at that level. But looking at the budget, she just needed to be transparent yeah. that our ratio of pupil teacher, I mean, of counselor to student is lower. But if I may? It's a significant number. Yes. It is a significant number to consider. And, and if I may, and it's true, Drew, ever since I've been here, that's one of the things that they say we need more <laughs> counselors. Because what happens is you have people at the top working on administration and they generalize. But like you said, it depends on their economic status, their ability to learn. Every child is different. So what this district has done in the past is look at and, and see what we needed. And that was something that was suggested that they needed. Somebody up there made some kind of uh, generalization on the budget, which is good. But as a district, administration recommends, hey, we need more of this. Well, we're allowed to do that. She's just doing the generalization because she doesn't work directly with all the districts. But it's, it's more like, a, like a, 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 a plan that is laid out, and then we go from there, and we've tweaked it. And so when you take it back to the original plan of the generalization, and we are over counselors, like she said, we need to look at why it was done, look at our area, look at the students, look at the need. It's not for her to say, this is what you need to do and you have to comply. No, these are just suggestions that she has been hired to make and she has a certain formula that she uses to be able to tell us where we're at. But at the end of the day, the final decision is made by the board because we need to take care of the front line because we, it's really important that they succeed. Go ahead. Dr. Gutierrez. Thank you. Dr. Gutierrez. Um, no, I just wanted to say, if, if, if you could take this information here, I mean, sometime between now and the next couple of budget um, workshops we have over here and then come up with some recommendations because it, regardless of how we look at it, I mean, the ratios at the secondary level are significantly, uh, that's very significant and you can't get away from it. You, you know, including the gear up, which are not that many, you know, but you need to come up and you, you know, it, it's not just the board decides in the end based on your recommendation. So the board can't say keep everybody. Yeah. It has to come from administration and let's see, you know, I'm pretty sure you have some ideas that you'll eventually filter into the process here. And, and please note that previous administration made this recommendation. Yeah. Now we sure. have someone new. Sure. It was a previous administration. And, and I was yeah. going to actually mention that because I think that we had a similar presentation when Dr. Hatton was here. And we realized that we were overstaffed, you know, and at that point, if I remember correctly, we were supposed to, um, um, f by attrition, attrition. We, were supposed yeah. to, we were supposed to be doing, but whatever happened between now and then, if she followed, if Dr. Hatton at the time followed through, and if that was communicated to it now, Dr. Gutierrez and his new team, you know, I don't know if there was a disconnect, but at the time there was a consensus but did they do a task study like this or no. how, how did we know there was an assessment there was something yeah, there because was. we had yeah. we had data carmelita as we did oh okay. yeah there was something because we we had no, some we um data we had data and we already i mean this is not uh news flashing i think we all knew this already we were overstopped i think, I think the we number is what surprises me I, I knew we were a little bit over but that's quite a few yeah Th it that's it the is. numbers what hit me in the yes, face but okay whether or not we agree that the consensus that we had at the time, you know, that we still want to do that, that we by, don't want to be attrition. overstaffed. Yeah, by attrition. You know, right. Mm -hmm. And so take care of the student. Foremost, take care of the student. Don't let the student fail. Yeah, and we have a significant at-risk population. Yes. I'm, I'm just uh, mm -hmm. noting that it is a large number. That's all. Yeah. Dr. Kanto? Yes. One of the things that I just wanted to clarify, and I think, Mr. Cowan, you touched on it, um, the counselors here, they were all grouped together. We have the at-risk counselors that are funded through special funded programs. We have, at some point, there was a decision p to add at-risk counselors and then college readiness counselors. So we have, what has happened in this report, we put them all together, because at the end of the day, they're counselors. But so I just wanted to clarify that it, it, it includes everyone, all the counselors including the address. I do want to add something. I'm just kind of concerned that we group them together. And again, you know, this is just um, because we need to be very careful that we're using these special funding that we're not supplanting, right? And so we just, Correct. I don't know if they're actually, I, I don't know if it's a good, you know, I think that we should get a report that does not include anything that has to do with um, those, uh, those counselors that are funded through those special uh, 
to the special funding. Dr. Tipton, you're absolutely correct when it comes to the point that uh, the supplanting issue. So that's why the, the ones that are funded through special funds, you know, we cannot overlap the duties with the regular counselor. So there is some separation. But we can certainly get you a, a report as to how many at-risk counselors we have and how many college-ready counselors are. Total. We mm -hmm. can certainly separate that. So <coughs> the supplemental counselors that are listed there, or those, let me go back. The 27 secondary and three elementary counselors, those don't fall under the supplemental counselors? They're all grouped in together. They're all grouped together. And see, yes. if I may, uh, that is the big issue here. And that's why I say when you do a generalization, the way you're doing it, which is fine because that's the, your, your way of operating and that's the custom, which is correct. You need to be very, very, very careful because when you do what you're asking and you separate them, then you turn around and you're going to get all the gear up and all those counselors out and who's going to do the job. We're back to square one. So be very careful because she's doing a generalization. So we can't just jump and say, oh, get rid of all that. No, 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 wait. Because it was done by previous administration way before Dr. Hatton, because I remember when this happened with these counselors. Ever since I've been on here, counselors is a big thing. Like Drew said, we didn't know that we were that much over because we were asked to bring it down to 250 because children need the assistance. So make sure that we're not putting everybody in the same group and at the end of the day when we cut them off, we end up cutting our throat by accident and I want that to happen to our children. Thank I you. Remember, I remember a discussion among the board not that long ago, uh, I think last year when we were looking, we were actually talking about lowering ratios. No, we didn't do it, but we were actually discussing it. And uh, so I guess that's why I'm surprised by this right now. I mean, just noting it, that's all. Yeah. Ma Madam Chair, uh, we need to, as a board, we need to keep in mind that, you know, this is kind of peer comparisons. And so uh, these other districts also have their special uh, mm -hmm. types of counselors blended in. Okay, and it's not just us. I mean, like, they don't have gear up. Yes, they do. They don't have at risk. Yes, they do. And, and so, you know, we have an unusual situation here where somehow or another we have a ratio of 1 to 242, whereas everybody else uh, is, uh, where the benchmark is closer to 1 and 350. So we're really out of sync with everybody else on the counselor area, including everything. How you resolve that, I don't know. But doctor, that's why you get paid and I don't. I have a question on that, Ms. Well, Pusey. you know, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to ask her, how did we come up, or, oh, wh where is it established that it's 1 to 350? Is that uh, something that was established years ago, no, or when that did that get established in that manner? Actually, uh, if I may, uh, Dr. Timpton, mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, the ratio recommended by TA was 1 to 400. Just in the last year, they moved it down to 1 to 350. So that is established, actually, by TA on their recommendation that a counselor could okay. serve 350. But but it's up to the district to choose because oh, yes, everything yes. the TEA and TASB are just recommendations. recommendations you know, then you're going to do what works for your district. Of course. No, thank yes. What's our ratio? This one right is here. Is I thought one it was uh, one for one of 500, wasn't it? No, no, no ma'am. It's, it's up there. It's up there, Ms. Perez. It's up there. Secondary and elementary uh, hours is one for every 242 students in secondary and one for every 344. Yeah. 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 I remember they were bringing it down to uh, two. So their benchmark is 350, and we're at one for 242. Okay, and one each for campus four. each campus has an at-risk counselor, a gear-up counselor. Not each campus. It all depends because elementary yeah, is different from middle school and middle school to high school. So how do we get a breakdown of well, exactly? Th this is uh, the overall the overall picture right. of all the counselors. Uh, if we're going to be looking at this and looking at our budget as we move on and, and in our third budget workshop, we'll talk more about this specifically because you can't say specifically we're over 27 counselors, we're going to remove 27 counselors right. because it all depends. There's academic counselors, mm -hmm. there's special ed counselors, there's gear up counselors, there's different types of counseling. It, it all depends where we could be over and balance out better, but I think we see that uh, we are low in the secondary ratio, you know, 242 students for one counselor overall, because at the end of the day, there is a counselor, like Dr. Trevino was saying, is serving kids at some point. It may not be an academic counselor, it may be a gear of counselor, it may be a special ed counselor, it may be some other counselor, but there is a counselor that could serve anywhere an average of 242 students in our district. 
at an average in secondary. So maybe next meeting or whenever we do this again, we can have an overview of exactly Correct. what campus right. has what, and then we can see where it is at the yes. 27. But this is also for us to keep in mind as we move on with the budget, to keep in mind, okay, look, do we really need another counselor? Can we look from within first mm -hmm. and see how we can balance through right attrition? And, and, and see if we can find someone that can fill in a vacancy somewhere else without having to bring in another new one because we see that there is a 27 over and or three in elementary and that's information for us as we get vacancies how we can balance without having to bring in additional staff. Okay. Um, I think everybody sees that with this crisis that we're facing right now with COVID-19, the oil crisis, uh, we will talk about that uh, at our next budget workshop about how it's going to impact uh, budgets across the state to, to all districts at the next biennium. And, and we'll talk about that. But this is a good study so that way we know what we need to do without overstaffing ourselves because if there's one thing that's going to get any district in trouble financially, it's an excessive staff versus the number of students. I remember when we used to be one um, counselor per 500. 500 it used to be at elementary not, and, not high school if we, tr if we just try to keep with a state benchmark I think that we can be fine but let's, let us try to stay as close as we can to the state benchmark as much as possible so that way we can keep an eye on our staffing patterns and not overstaff ourselves and over budget ourselves because uh, then they can financially can get us into trouble in, if I may mm -hmm. and I think that's a good idea all across the board in every department instead of trying to you know you're right we shouldn't make new positions with another title and, and bring up another pay uh, wherever we can reduce by attrition that's a really good idea I mean, right. and, and it's hard because in some departments we hear they want to bring this guy and this and no no we need to do it across the board because we need to make sure that out in the front line we keep the proper staff to make sure we succeed and continue to be the A district because that's a challenge. It's easy to climb up, it's really hard to stay up and continue to be an A district is what we're counting on. So, so Dr. Trevino, you said up until a year ago the benchmark was one in 400. So we were even more out of whack at one point. So now as they bring the benchmark down, then we're in better shape. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, Karen. Go ahead. Yeah, ready to forward? Is it okay? Yes. Okay, the, the next section was the library staff. And on this one, I just said consider implementing the alternate library staffing model, which the particular model is, is in the report. It reduces six secondary librarians and seven elementary librarians. It reduces seven secondary library aides and actually 14 elementary library aides. Uh, when you look at the peer computers in this area, the district employs 2.3 library staff per 1,000 students compared to the peer district average of 1.7. The, uh, and, and let me just, uh, I'll make a note on that particular slide as well. It's not up on the slide, but just in the report, you will see that uh, I look at the number of students on a campus being served by a librarian. And I did do some shared models where you might have at your very small elementary campuses, have a librarian serve two campuses with the library aid on each one of those campuses. Um, so that's kind of, you'll see the, uh, I explained the model within the report where you can see what I was actually doing there. Clinic staff considered the absorption of two RNs. Uh, the district is staffed at one to 706 uh, for, for a ratio. Uh, one to 750 is what we use as the area. Hannah High School employs four clinic staff compared to the other high schools. Uh, so there could be some reductions there at that campus uh, just to have it look more like your other campuses, other high school campuses. Uh, and then also evaluate the middle school model uh, to look at those variants that are uh, displayed at, in the middle school in the report uh, to see if you can correct some of those variants. Karen, I have a question if I may. Oh, yes, oh, ma'am. Uh, ma uh, 
so is there a model for clinic staff? I mean, you're talking about just trying to make them all look the same across the district, but is there any kind of benchmarks on any of that or any recommendations by the state? They, you know, like I said, the, the one to 750 is the ratio that it is given in a healthy student population, which, you know, most of our schools are. Yes, we sometimes have special needs students that we will uh, employ clinic uh, aids for some special needs students in your special education program. But for the most part, you can get the services. Uh, obviously, the RN provides the widest range of services. If you employ LDNs, then you have to make sure that you pair RNs with those LDNs because they must be supervised. And I would not have an RN supervised more than three LDNs. Uh, and then you can have clinic aids, but obviously a richer model is to have, your best model is to have our, all RNs at all of your campuses. Uh, the next step below that is to filter in some LVNs because you can, and the only thing they can't do is to write a care plan. They can administer a care plan. They can do tubing. Uh, most of the different things that, that need to be done on that campus that LVN can do, uh, but our RN can do it all if you look at it that way. But many districts have a combination of RNs and LVNs uh, across the district. But if it was me doing that, I would make sure I would limit a supervising role to an RN up to two to three LVNs and not more than that for sure. Karen, I have a question on this slide before. And uh, when you mentioned that you would recommend for at the small elementaries to share a librarian and have a full-time clerk, how small are you talking about? Like, how small would that elementary school be as I've got the number in there. I think it's your campuses around 400. Okay. I couldn't, I mean, yeah, I was flipping I through it to see if it was put, It's in the report, and I don't have the report up because I've got both screens being taken care okay, of. Okay, no, just go to not a problem. I'll look for it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was 400 and less. Okay, good question. Okay, the next uh, area that we're gonna look at is campus clerical, non-campus clerical, and educational aids. I will say you're, you might see some uh, larger numbers in this area, but at, at the beginning of the report, there's an analysis of the district staff, and you will see that y'all have a very large amount of auxiliary staff. And I wanna make sure that you realize when you talk auxiliary staff, it's not just who you think of as far as transportation, custodial, nutrition services, maintenance, but your campus and non-campus clerical are included in that number. So I wanna make sure that you know that, that when you see uh, where your staff compared to your peer districts and to the state averages in this area, that, that it is quite large and much of it, you know, it's a combination really of all these areas. So. Starting with the uh, campus clerical, you could consider the absorption of up to 54 positions. The secondary benchmark is 5.5 positions per 1,000 students. Uh, the secondary bench, uh, campuses right now employ 157 total campus clerical staff. And this is compared to the where you would be at the benchmark of 124.5. So, that would be the reduction of 32.5 positions. And then at the element, the benchmark is a little bit lower. It's 4.5 per 1,000 students. And at the elementary campuses, you employ 112. If you were at benchmark, you would, you would have 90 of them. So that's 22 for a total of 54 campus clerical staff. I have a question. I have a question on the on the yes. campus clerical. Uh, did you find out what our people are doing? Uh, all the different uh, staff uh, clerks and whatever, compared to these other peer camp uh, peer school systems. Or sc 
because you know we have uh, 112 that's 22 at uh, the elementary more than most school systems in Texas have which is like 90 uh, so what are our people doing uh, and what are these other people not doing Right. I mean, the typical duties now, what, you know, what your people are, I, I didn't do job descriptions on all the positions, unfortunately, that would be, uh, you know, it's really about taking positions and comparing them to other positions and doing the statistical analysis on it versus digging into what their job descriptions are. But typically what you have at an elementary campus is someone who is a receptionist and will do either the PINGS part of uh, the staffing reporting or do the student attendance. And then you have typically a cleric, a secretary, and then you may have somebody who, you know, it depends. It's usually staffed two to three individuals at an elementary campus if you're talking the size of 400 to say 600 students. Obviously when you get up to 800 to 1000 elementary students, you're going to have to be close to that four positions, but they divvy up those jobs, you know, amongst who, you know, usually the campus uh, secretary, the principal secretary is not just a secretary to a principal. A lot of times they're doing one of those other components, uh, whether it's entering discipline into the computer or the administrators or uh, taking care of the budget typically. You know, it's the roles are pretty similar across school districts as far as what their jobs are. It's how many you have doing it and how you've got it up that, that will look different. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, uh, in taking that in consideration, because here's another area where uh, I mean, we're getting close to 100 staff at this point here, and we're not even past the second page. Uh, but you might want to see what people are doing, we'll talk to the principals see some way to remedy the situation, uh, you know, uh, assign more tasks to the same person. I don't know if that's possible or whatever. I, I have no idea. Well, I really don't know what the, the, these people do on, on the campus, but it's, 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 you know, some feedback from the administration on this is probably be a good idea in all these little different areas. What exactly are these people doing? And if I may also, uh, because it's true, because I do uh, care partner in several schools, and I've gone into the main office, and, and you sit there and you push the button for them to open the door to go in, and they're with parents around the phone, and, and I always thought, my gosh, we don't have enough people here to take care of the business because we serve the community, and this is what, how we sell ourselves, that how you treat the people that walk into your office and how you make them feel is gonna make them proud that they're part of your school. So for, for this, this is kind of weird to see this on paper that we're way overstaffed, and like Dr. Like Mr. Cowan said, but when you, when you walk into the school, it's a different, it's a different thing. Reality. So find out exactly what they are doing, and they're maybe doing something important or something to keep the school going. Because we're doing well with what we're doing. We're trying to uh, make sure that we can be uh, financially responsible, and I totally understand that. But let's not do it in the fact that we end up crippling ourselves and not helping ourselves. But let's get a detail what they are doing. Because, like I said, remember, she's doing a general. She's a, it, it's not an fits all, but it's applied to all. But then everybody has to tweak it to, like, going into a store and buying the same shoe. It's going to be a different, color, different size, but it's the same, you know, style of shoe. Same thing here. So if we could do that, that would be excellent to find out what exactly they do and uh, justify just just to add I, I i agree with miss peña but also we have to remember that other school districts throughout texas also have the same challenges and also have other people come by and visit us and they get the same calls that we get and if they make it work then we need to be conscientious and we have to take that into consideration when we move forward not just we want to keep everybody and you know yeah. because it, even with customer service, I mean, there's still a lot of things that we've talked about that we could do to improve, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a room full of people, of employees, to improve those ways, you know? Yeah. So if and other it's districts not make it work and throughout Texas, I think that, you know, that's why this information is important. And it's, I agree with you, but thank you. I'm sorry to say, and I'll always be like this till God calls me home. I'm not other districts. I'm this district, and I'm here to take care of it. And I want to make sure that we do the best, and I always go above and beyond, because that's just how I think. I apologize if it, that maybe steps on people's toes, 
but I want us to be the best and do what we can, and if we can do it, let's do it. Let's not take uh, shortcuts and corners and say, well, we're going to cut these frontline positions, and then we're going to make two or three administrative positions where with that salary, I could have kept six or eight and have better service in the front. Because to me, it's really important that BISD stands out and be the example. And I respect, yes, everybody's different, but that's just my personal opinion. But I, I respect exactly what Laura says. She's correct on and that. And if I can just respond, Ms. Peña, you don't step on my toes. I'm just saying what, what it is. What no, it no is. not and yours. We, I mean, other people who are listening. Not yours, ma'am. OK. Well, other I'm, people just who clarifying. Are listening. I'm just clarifying. Yes. And no, it no. doesn't, my comment didn't mean that I don't want to no. take care or no, that no, you no, should no, care not, any more than I am. No, not I at do. all. Not because at all, of your comment. Yeah, that's no, I, I felt the same way with yours, so. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I answered. Ms. Brown. Okay. A couple, I was going to say somebody had a good point while ago, and I'm not exactly sure who was talking, but, you know, when you said, let's talk to the administrators on those campuses, let's find out what the individuals are doing, that's a very good point. And also, sometimes taking somebody who's newer to the district that has experience in another district might see it from a different set of lenses than somebody that's been in the district. And so maybe compare both of those conversations as to how to evaluate these types of positions. And then the second point that I wanted to make was uh, to make sure that you know that when you look at the information as it's analyzed, you'll see it's analyzed by campus. And so look at those campuses that are closer to the benchmark versus those that are not and find out what's going on at those campuses. How are they causing, you know, how are they working more efficiently than those that have a larger staff? And so that's definitely what you can do with the data that's provided in the report. Ms. Brown? Well, obviously um, there's a lot more than just numbers on a page that we've got to consider. Uh, but it does give us uh, some talking points, but we would expect that administration would also go back I received a text a minute ago about the absorbing two RNs at Hannah. Apparently, Hannah has a lot of life skill units, so there's a justification for those additional RNs there. Plus, in my opinion, we don't have enough RNs. We've kind of migrated to an LVN kind of situation, and uh, not it's not a bad situation, but it'd be nice if we had a few more RNs. But anyway, um, yeah, it's it's got to be this report plus what we see and know in our own situation exactly. as well. You're just making recommendations of areas for us to look at, but the numbers are a little startling. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, okay. Dr. Gutierrez? Yeah, and I want to say that uh, when it comes to this uh, campus clerical staff, um, as a superintendent and as well as uh, the board, now we see that uh, we really need to hold the line and, and be able to move or work within our staff from within because we can do that if we have that flexibility. This one on the campus clerical staff, it has been mainly on, on us, the administration, because it's the administration has, that has hires this staff. It doesn't necessarily come directly to the board. So uh, this one is on, on me to make sure that it doesn't continue to grow, but it continues to go down and balance better. Uh, we may be overstaffed uh, depending on given campuses, populations, and situations. We may be overstaffed here and there, but it cannot be 54. It can be uh, less than that, but that's on me and my staff to, to make sure that if there's a clerical opening that uh, we have from within to balance out and not bring in somebody else new, and I'll continue saying that. And, and as a superintendent, uh, obviously it doesn't come to the board. It, it, it's at my level to make sure that it gets balanced better. This one has never been on the board. It's always been on, on the administration to, to make sure that that number doesn't grow any more than what it is right now. And it's something you inherited when you came. Go ahead. Clerical is your clerical staff that are outside of the campuses. So in all your support departments, in your central administration. And so this one uh, was considered absorbing up to 82 of the non campus clerical positions. The benchmark in this area is four for 1,000 students. And you currently employ 207 non campus clerical staff. And the benchmark uh, would be 124.5 considering your student enrollment. You can See this definitely in the peer comparison where the district employs 1.2 per 1,000 students for the job titles that we surveyed compared to 0.6 for the peer districts. 
and it's pretty much you know district wide you need to look at all evaluate all departments it's not just a specific department that stands out uh, there appears to be multiple uh, clerical staff in each one of your uh, departments instructional aids uh, you could consider absorbing up to 199 general education aids uh, it's what's unique about this one is that you are you have more on the general education side than on the special education side and you'll see the special education recommendation in just a few minutes where i actually say to add positions there uh, the benchmark for educational aids is 13.7 per 1000 students and that's for general ed and special education the uh, absorption secondary could absorb 53 positions and elementary 86 positions. Uh, I did make an adjustment for pre-K because y'all are doing uh, what the state would recommend at pre-K, which is a two to 22 ratio, which means that you have a teacher and an aide in each one of the classrooms. So I backed out uh, some aides because of that and made a specific adjustment because of that. Um, also, I talked about library aids uh, a while ago. P, uh, PE is another area that will give you some opportunity for absorptions uh, when you, we get to that area of the report. But as I said, Ms. the problem with this Ms. particular, when we I have say a question. 86 and 53, Ms. is the fact that it does not add up to 199. Ms. Uh, and Ms. Karen. Is because Ms. I had, uh -huh. We have a question. Yeah, yeah real quick. Uh, when okay. you said uh, uh, the adjustment due to the pre-K staffing. So in those 86, you are not putting the ones that are in pre-K. Am I correct? You're saying that the, right. the additional adjustments due to pre-K, so in, those, in that 86 total, you're not putting in the pre-K where it has two for 22, or you are including the those pre-K totals in right. that 86? Right. I, okay, right which way? elementary school could, could have a larger number there but no, that's not I the question. made adjustment for pre-K okay. and put you and staffed you a little bit higher than the 13.7 to 1,000, if that makes sense. No, uh, let me ask again. And the 86 number that you wrote down there, do you see your, your 86? You, are you including the pre-K staff instructional aids in that 86 total? No, no, that okay. is everything but pre-K. Thank you, thank you. I want to make sure I, I heard that correctly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Doctor. And then I wanted to make sure that I clarify for you that when you add 86 and 53, you do not get 199. And the reason that you don't is because you need 60 uh, special education aids. And so I had to offset the number here on general ed side to accommodate the, the need for 60, the addition of 60 aids on the special education side. Okay, and I'll talk to that in just a few minutes when I get to special education. Okay, uh, Doctor, this, I think at these last two slides, this is another area where that's if the ball's in your court, not in ours, and you're gonna have to make those calls. I, I do know, and I, a couple of years ago, uh, when my uh, grandchildren, some of my grandchildren lived in Plano, and I looked at their number of adults, or students per adult, who worked for the district, Plano was like 17 students per adult, and Brownsville was like 14.5 students per adult, something like that. So we, you know, that, that alone right there would tell me that we're a little off. You know, we have a lot more staff compared to other things. But we're now at 300, <laughs> you know. Anyway, thank you. I, ha I have a question. <coughs> And I'm, and I'm actually following the, the booklet along uh, with the PowerPoint. So I'm on page 35. And, and I go back to, and I'm on secondary educational aids. So if I follow this correctly, you break down aid education, aid, uh, an aid for pre-K, an aid for ISS, library, PE, clinic. And there we go, there we have other right so i think that you know at least i'm going to speak for myself but i'm struggling because it's very <coughs> difficult at least for myself to make a decision or make any informed decisions without knowing the job description for these ftes 
because we don't know, you know, the need of every campus. And so it, it makes it very difficult. And I go back to every, every other item we've covered, instruction, um, counselors, uh, clerical staff. So it makes it very difficult, at least for me to, you know, we, if we, don't, we don't know if their job description is aligned to that FTE on that specific campus. Because for example, here, you know, we have eight other, you know, we don't know what the description is for that FTE, for those FTEs. Um, I mean, I could see the eight on the ISS, PACE has one uh, ISS, but of course the other, the other schools don't show any. So it just, you know, I'm struggling with that piece and I just wanted to, to let my colleagues know as well that, um, that it makes it very difficult when we don't have a, we don't know, you know, if that FTE is linked to, yes. Uh, what, uh, but, but keep in mind one thing, Dr. Tipton. Uh, it's actually, the, it's the, the board's not going to make a decision there. It's going to be the administration. Yes, and they're going to have to reevaluate things. And I, I think anybody is working for us. Uh, you know, because Dr. Gutierrez uh, pointed out something a minute ago is very significant. You know, rather than hiring somebody to replace somebody, okay, you know, so we want to absorb these numbers. We can say, okay, you're over here. We're going to move you over here, you know, because it's a lateral transfer from one place to the other or mm -hmm. however he wants to do it. That's going to be totally mm -hmm. his call, mm -hmm. you know, and which, uh, what was it, you know, should be because he's running the district and, you know, he's in charge the uh it, it pretty much everything in the district over there in that matter if i may dr Gutierrez, on that uh she does when she does her study she compares it to other positions that other districts have so most of the other districts that she's comparing us to has a pre-k has iss has library has pe etc the other is what we have that is not connected to something another district may have. We have a unique kind of position. Like if you look at Lincoln Park, because that is a special school, they have four that's other because maybe these kids are, or these age may be taking care of the babies, for example, and that's not something that's common in the other districts. Well, as a matter of fact, we do have like hall monitors here in, in some of our right. campuses. Yeah. Okay. See. That could also be other because I was kind of like saw that here and I said, okay, I had, never, I had never seen that specific job title given in, in a district. So that could be also part of other that like a home monitor, uh, the babies at uh, Lincoln Park. Those could be the other that mo other districts don't have that are unique to Bronzeville. And if I may, uh, I do want to point out that the district has been really good, even with several administrations, uh, people uh, uh, reducing the positions by attrition, for example, hall monitors. So year after year after year, the district has been really good at trying to reduce the positions that were not needed. And like you said, fill the ones that were here with people that are maybe extra in one school. So the district has been very responsible of that, and I've seen that happen. And so I just, I'm just i sure that this is the same way you want to continue doing it. Our objective is not to go and tell someone, you know what, you don't have a job tomorrow. Our objective is to balance that out so we can fill the positions, so we can do the job correctly. The only thing that I know that you're going to do really well is make sure that we do what is right to make sure the front line is doing a great job because they're doing really well. And I don't want people to look at this study because if you look at this study and you see it on, it scares the heck out of you. It scares the bejeebies out of you. But this is just a general uh, uh, information of what because that's what she does for the whole state and every district has to follow the general uh, uh, alignment of what she's going to look at and then everybody the ratios are going to be decided by each individual school district which is what the district has been doing in a, and doing a really good job so like I mentioned we've had the hall monitors and they were reduced by attrition and and changed without affecting anyone's livelihood but making sure we stay within our budget to continue to have our pay for our employees and continue to move forward. So I thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. Karen. Yeah, I was I was just gonna add one more comment. You know, many times many districts have somebody in that other category. It's common for us to have something what we see in that other category a lot of times are computer lab aid, liaisons, uh, you know, different things like that. And it's just it's just positions that are unique usually to a district that we put over in that one as opposed to the ones that we've established. As you see, that's a very long uh, 
chart anyway. And if we put every type of aid that we possibly see across the state, uh, state, it would go on and on and on. But remember the benchmark, you know, these are based on who's coded as an educational aid within a school district. And, you know, the state doesn't ask for all these different types of aids. We do the best we can to analyze it by the type or the district to help break it down for them. Okay, and look at trends throughout, you know, as we're going through the process. Okay, the next one, we're gonna get uh, into the special education staffing. This, you know, teacher, special education teacher for the number of teachers you have in your district, for the number of special education teachers that you have for the number of students. It, I mean, I'm saying absorb one position and that's it. You know, now there might need to be some balancing of some programs where I might say, you know, reduce two here, but you need two here. So depending on the analysis, when you look at that, you'll, you'll see that, but overall, you are almost right on target with what, what the benchmark is for special education teacher staff. Where I saw the area of concern in special education, one of them was with educational aids, as I said earlier. I say consider the addition of 60 special education aids. Uh, one of the positions was at elementary, but 59 were at the secondary campuses. And you can see the different, I look at the four different areas of instructional setting for special ed, resource inclusion being one, life skills, autism being one, behavior, and then PPCE. So overall, the uh, addition of 31 elementary and 39 secondary resource inclusion aids, but the reduction of 17 elementary life skills, autism aids, but the increase of 10 secondary the uh, reduction of 11 elementary school behavior aids, but the addition of 10 secondary, and then the reduction of two uh, 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 PPCD aids were thrown at the elementary campuses. And so overall, it was an increase of 59 secondary aid positions and uh, one elementary position. Uh I've got certain benchmarks and you'll see those in the report where what the established benchmark is from the area and I analyze them campus. We have a Miss Karen, we have a question. I, I just want to ask yes. a question. It's actually for the HR or the business office. Are the instructional aids from like kinder to the special aid aids the same pay grade or is it different? Okay. Sorry, I apologize. Yes, uh, what I was saying is that the inst uh, regular instructional aides are at a pay grade three, and your special ed aides are at a pay grade four. So my recommendation, if we have an excess of instructional aides on the regular side, regular ed, we could have the an excess have the prin principals interview them and make a recommendation for those that we, we could we could move right into Somewhere pay grade four. Okay. But it would be through a recommendation. Yes, because right. it's a different pay grade that, yes. th that I would approve. And mm -hmm. we've done that many times, sir, already. So it would be a good way t to take our excess staff over to fill any vacancies that she's recommending. Okay. Yeah. And also keeping in mind that these aides do need to have a certificate from ESPEC. Uh, so it's just not like a clerk. We have an excess amount of clerks. They can't move into these positions unless they have a certificate. So we'd have to offer that training or, or do something. Uh, they need 48 hours, college hours, to be in a special ed unit or to qualify for a certificate. So, so those yeah. excessive aids that we have already meet that criteria. Correct, correct. You're so like your PE and, and any of those. And we have plenty have of, of over staff that we can, uh, we okay. have a pool. We have a good, good pool of applicants from within. Good. That's the word. Okay, Karen, sorry. Okay. Do you, and just, I was kind of listening to y'all's conversation, but are you talking about, uh, Dr. Trevino, you're talking about the highly qualified, the either the 48 hours or the associate degree or the showing that they're, uh, I guess, uh, if they were, in, say the area of math, science, I mean, math, reading and, and writing. 
Is that what you're talking about when you say they their certificate? Right, because in order to be in the special ed unit as an aide, you need to have your SBEC certification. You have to be highly qualified, but all, all your aides, right, educational aides have... have no, yes, correct. I, I was just making that correct. point, correct. It's just that, it, like, for example, okay. a clerk that we're over, we can't just automatically interview them for one of these positions because they need to meet the highly qualified. A clerk, I get it. I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, yes, yes. Unless they're, I mean, but they can be recommended for the certificate, correct, if they qualify. If they meet it. the criteria, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Um, next area for special education is assessment staff. These are going to be your diagnosticians and your licensed specialist in school psychology. And I say consider the addition of nine special education assessment staff. The caseload that we look at benchmark is one of those assessment staff for 80 to 85 students. And right now you are at one per 101. And so I, you know, recommend nine in order to get you to that benchmark level of 80 to 85. Uh, the district does employ LSSPs and diagnosticians. You get a little broader range of services from an LSSP if you can find them. Sometimes they're harder to find, but they can also provide the behavioral testing that diagnosticians typically do not, as well as they can uh, provide some behavior intervention and some counseling as well. Okay. The next one is speech. I keep hitting the wrong button. Sorry about that. The speech staff. Consider the addition of seven speech staff. Here the caseload is 45 to 50 students and your current caseload is 62.9 uh, students per speech staff. Uh, Y'all do employ LSPs, uh, SLPs, which is speech language pathologists and speech assistants. Uh, when you employ a speech assistant, they have to be supervised by that speech language pathologist. So uh, SLPs are gonna cost you more, but you get more out of them because of the scope of services that they can provide students versus a speech assistant. Okay, teachers, we're gonna look at elementary, then middle school, and then high school. So for teachers, uh, you can consider absorbing 42 elementary teachers. This was calculated on 22 to one at pre-K through grade four. And then uh, at grade five, I did use 25 to one. The state average is 19.5 to 20.5. Uh, where your average right now is 19.8 uh, or would be 19.8 if you were to absorb these 42 teachers. So you would still be at the low end of the benchmark if you were to uh, take this recommendation. And question. these are just teachers. We have a question. Okay. On that particular one where you put the district would be state average is calculation 20 to 1. What is our actual then? Why did you not put out our actual? I'm sorry, I had a difficult time hearing that. Okay, I, I noticed I you, you, on, on that slide that we're looking at, you put state average 19.5 to 20.5. District average would be 19.8. What is our district average, our actual? Not would be, but actual. Right now, right now it's in the report. And like I, said, I do not have the report up because of what I've got on my screens. But if I'm not mistaken, it was 18, maybe 18. 18.3 or 18.6 is where you were at right now. And if you were to absorb the 42 elementary teachers, that would put you at 19.8. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just wondering, because you put it on everything else, but you didn't put it on this particular one. Was it just a uh, oversight, not putting our average on this one, since you put it on the other ones with the teachers, librarians, and everything we were over? You didn't put it on this one, how much we were? Was that just an oversight that we forgot to add it to this? And the reason I ask, because I'm sure Dr. Gutierrez, correct me if I'm wrong, this will be public information, right? This report. So and then, because um, I wanted to know, maybe we can put in the actual, because on, on the rest of the paperwork, you did put in how much we were over, over staff or what we needed to do. But on this particular slide, you, uh, that accidentally got left off. So if, you, if we can maybe find a way, if we do release this, we can put what ours is now. So it'll have the same, answers on this slide that it has on the other slide as far as the overstaffing on our part. 
Could we do that? Is it possible? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Did I need did I need to do anything for y'all? Was that a request for something or no, was no. it something y'all well, about uh, in my you said that the information is in the book, so I guess our administration could just look in the book to get that answer and just put it on that slide. So yes, when this yes. gets released, yes, it, it'll have an answer to it. If you need, yes, yes. If you want to add something to, to a slide, please just let me know, and I will make a correction on the slide. Yeah. So on this slide, you want me to put what the actual is right now, just above where it says the average would be. That, I, that yes, would be I awesome. Believe, if you I could. believe it's on page uh, fifty-five, Karen where it says the overall okay. class average in grades pre-K to five increases slightly from 19.6 to 19.8 students per class at the low end of the benchmark. Oh, okay, okay, so it's 19.6 right, right now. So by absorbing 42 teachers, it would just increase it to 19.8. Yeah. And I age up students that are in the next except for pre-k and k i keep the numbers the same because i have no way of knowing what's going to happen with your pre-k and k students so i keep whatever your numbers are right now at pre-k and k for next year and then i age up your k to one your first graders to second your second to third all the way up through high school okay so Quick. just let you know how i've got your projected enrollment question question excuse me dr gutierrez uh, if you can look on page 50 of the, uh, I guess the study, the staffing review. The, yeah, the graph chart? Yes. Uh huh. And you have the graphs there, teacher comparison. And there's two striking areas to me where, uh, I mean, I know we're talking 42 would be absorbed, but on bilingual ESL education, uh, all of other uh, districts, our peer districts that we're being compared to are way, way above us. I mean, six, uh, astronomically above us. And on gifted and talented the same way, is there, could you, not now, but uh, in this budget process, figure out some way to address those two things? Because, uh, you know, general ed, some uh, of the other stuff, teachers all, we uh, compare well. Everything. I, I believe Those in, two areas yeah. are really significant. I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, or HR, but the teachers are here. It's a certification that is not here. Correct. That's what we talked about. A Remember, we, we had a discussion at the board meeting? We have the staff. We're, in fact, we're over 42, but... That doesn't answer the question. Does that answer the question? Because, okay, you can say on the ESL. You know, somehow or another, you know, and I don't want to get into it right now. Right. But you, you have to uh, speak Spanish to teach English, you know, which doesn't make any sense to me. But GT, what's, what's going on there? Is that the hours, Karen, that they don't have? That they should have? Because GT is about getting hours. No, I know. 30 hours I mean, a year, what, what, uh, per year, if I, if I recall. You know, I mean, it's GT. You don't have to take a test to do. You know, no, you just have to go take the courses. So what's going on there? I mean, it's beyond this meeting, but yeah. uh, it would be good yeah. to look at it. Right. And then I think that it, could and go ahead. Yeah, that could be a PINS coding thing too. If you're not coding your GT teachers, you know, you're not you're not capturing those sections or GT. That could be what's going on. And I can look at your PEAMS data standard data to see that's where I should be able to see what that looks like compared to your peers. So it could be a coding issue. It could be on both sides. I understood that the problem on the ESL certification was more a secondary problem, problem in the secondary education, you know, with a, the, 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 where we had staff, uh, you know, rather than elementary. Ms. Benya. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Thank you. It's, I'm sorry. I wasn't finished because uh, I was. I want to go back, Karen, to that slide. Well, you used to have it on there because you mentioned to me that you thought it was 18.6 is what we should be, and and uh, and uh, the district sh would be average would be 19.8. So then, 18.6. So on page 55, it has 19.6. So where is the 18.6 that you say? Where do you have that? On what page? Yeah, do you that have was that? just. I was just saying a number off the top of my head because I do not have the report open. I knew that it was less than 19.8. Okay. So well, then let me let me let me let me understand then. 
because according to page 55, which Dr. Thelina uh, uh, brought up, uh, our current for BISD is 19.6. Our proposed would be 19.8, but the state average is 19.5. So we are pretty much uh, in accordance with the state because if 19 point right, you're, the, you're already at 19.6 you're right at the low end of the benchmark and we're absorbing 42 positions you're still at the low end of the benchmark at 19.8 but we are you at know, the benchmark in the rest of the state the mid part of the yes benchmark. yes i understand but we are at the benchmark with the rest of the state so we have other school districts that are also in this am i correct is that correct to yes. read yes Okay. It ranges from 19.5 to 20.5. I appreciate it's it. Thank just, you. I mean, anytime we do the 22 to 1 ratio, and when we do that across the board, that's where I got the 42. And you can Great. see specifically campus by campus where those numbers would, you know, where they are Thank within the, uh, within the, that, those spreadsheets. <laughs> okay. But we're at the benchmark, right, but we're at the low end is what you're saying. But we are at the benchmark. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, the next thing, I did evaluate the elective teachers at the elementary campuses, and the purpose for doing that was I, I noticed some discrepancies uh, in the staffing levels, and it was more, uh, you know, there seemed to be, I, I look at staffing sometimes as, sometimes I see like a deck of cards where they're just divvying up positions amongst campuses, and so that was kind of what I saw happening here. So I did a deep dive into the elective teachers for the elementaries and in the process came up with an alternate model for elective teachers that I felt like did a better job of serving students. Uh, I say you can absorb up to seven positions and actually the current ratio, you have a one to 71 student ratio at one campus all the way up to one to 169 students per elective staff and when i say elective staff i'm talking pe which would be a teacher and or an aide uh, music and and so this particular reduction could could uh, occur reducing 12 pe teachers but would result in the addition of five art teachers which is broadening your uh, offerings to students and helping feed into your fine arts programs as they move into the middle school and high school. Uh, it reduces the variance from the one to 71 to one to 102 to one to 158. Uh, and like I said, it, it includes the absorption of the PE teachers and also seven PE aides, but increases art by five teachers. And I used a number depending on the enrollment. That's how I determined what the staffing was. And inside the report, I detailed how I was assigning those allocations to those campuses. Okay, the next one is middle school. As I said, with middle school, you know, I aged up students as well from fifth grade to sixth grade, from sixth to seventh, seventh to eighth, and then the eighth went up to, to ninth grade. I did calculate them on a 22 to 1 ratio. Uh, the state average is 22 to 24. And I kept it right at the bottom of the benchmark uh, for the recommendation. And it would be to absorb 25 middle school teachers. Two campuses would need to increase in FTEs. So there's a variance with two of the campuses compared to the other eight, where two looks like they need to increase in their FTEs but eight campuses could decrease. And uh, obviously additional savings, if you were to increase your benchmark to 23 to one or 24 to one, you could have additional cost savings. And this is all teaching staff except for your special education staff. The next one is the absorption of 82 high school teachers. Again, this was calculated on a 22 to one ratio using the master schedule provided to me by the by the campuses. The state average for high schools is 22 to 25 students. Um, this would impact all campuses. Uh, they could all decrease FTEs and additional savings could be uh, generated at a 23 to one or a 24 or 24 to one ratio. Yes, Ms. Brown. Um, 
are some of these um, um, irregularities in our um, in our formulas based perhaps on the fact that we've lost students for several years now and we have not reduced our staff yes and so our exactly. ratios are becoming look high because we have in no way shape or form reduced staff okay all right that makes sense okay thank you yeah that's a good point and that that historical that historical analysis at the very start of the report where we look at the five-year enrollment trend versus your different your total staff or the different areas like teaching staff administrative staff and so forth that definitely will show you what has happened as enrollment has decreased, what has happened with your different staffing areas. So I would definitely recommend looking at that at the very beginning of the report, and that's a good point that you made. Ms. Doodley, if I may, uh, Ms. T Dr. Tipton, if I may. Uh, of course, I'm also curriculum, so I love teachers, <laughs> and I, certainly I want our pupil-teacher ratio to be uh, as reasonable as possible without breaking the bank also, right, because you all have that on your shoulders that you need to ensure academic success, but also with a balanced budget. Uh, but I just want to uh, point or direct everyone's attention to page 65, because currently our overall class averages can range from 9.1 to 21 in our high schools and by absorbing all these teachers it would just bring it up to 14.2 so we'd still be okay I don't want to lose any teachers because I love teachers and, and we need to but you know we just need to do maybe a better job when we're doing the master schedule so I want to let you know that we'll be looking at that closely to ensure that we have balanced numbers and not one teacher have 30 in the class where somebody else has a smaller amount And if I may, just on that, because uh, it's really difficult because of all the extracurricular activities. And that's, and that, and that's something that, that I know the district has struggled with for years and years and years. So that's something that's really difficult, and I commend you if you can figure out how to do that. Because it, it, it has a lot to do with the classes that they have to take at a certain hour of the day, which compounds the fact that now there's more students in this class due that they have to be in another class at a certain hour. So we can balance that out. My hat's off to you because it's a tough one. So thank you for that. <laughs> Madam Chair. Mr. Carlin. On the, the uh, excess amount of teachers that we have elementary middle school and high school that's being referred to here uh, this is another area where i mean in one sense that even though the board chooses to hire we don't make the decision as to what to put at work campuses and everything but you're going to need to give us feedback on uh, where the changes need to be made and what you're doing about this because this is a significant amount of staff very very significant i mean it's you know yeah, I think what you'll see in, I'm going to say the next three years, uh, it will be the movement of staff uh, with intent that nobody loses their job. Uh, that's num priority number one. But what everyone needs to understand, and I'm going to take off my mask to make it loud and clear, is that movement of staff is going to be an expectation for us to balance for the next three years. I know that some staff members are very happy, very comfortable at a particular school. And we're going to try to work very hard to accommodate everyone where they're happy and they want to be. But at the same time, for us to balance, for us to bring these numbers down, for us to keep our finances healthy, is going to be where it might be a little uncomfortable to some, but we got to look at the what's best for the district. We're keeping everyone with a job, and we are going to do the best that we can to make sure that we balance the best that we can and keep everyone where they want to be. But there's going to have to be movement, and there's going to have to be uh, where we all agree that that's going to be done in a very fair way as much as possible, but movement is going to happen, and it's going to, everyone needs to understand that, and it's going to be something that's going to, uh, I see this for the next three years at, at least, for us to be able to balance without bringing in new staff, but with intent to keep everyone in their jobs. Ms. Brown? Yeah, these numbers are astounding. And 
without a doubt, every time we hire somebody, we're going to have to really scrutinize and make sure that there's not somebody in the district that we could maybe replace a position or something because these are large numbers. We we don't want to riff or anything like that. We want to maintain all our employees, but it does seem like there's going to have to be movement. And when we look at our historical data, we have lost students, significant numbers of students, and we haven't uh, perhaps adjusted some of these things, and now we have to. We're at a point where we're going to, it's crucial that we do so. And if I may piggyback on that, and, and it's a good point, Dr. Gutierrez, and I'm sure that it goes all the way to the top from administrative positions all the way to your maintenance, where you, you're right, if we're going to have a new position, maybe, you know, absorb this position with this salary to take now these duties on. That way we show that people in our community, they were being very frugal with our money and taking care of positions and positions that maybe are not needed are relabeled, but the the pay or, or the financial responsibility for the district doesn't change because the pay goes with it. It just changes maybe titles. So that's a great idea. And, and I want to say that uh, this is going to be um, throughout the state with the crisis that we're going through, COVID-19 and the oil crisis. Uh, these are going to be the tough decisions that are going to be made by every single district in Texas for the next three years. Uh, we may not feel it this coming year because this budget has already been established. But the next biennium, which is uh, 2020, uh, actually it's 21, 22, and 22 and 23 school years are going to be the toughest. Next year, we're still going to be able to manage because the budget has already been established. But the crisis of today would affect us in the year after next and then the following year. That is correct. Sorry, I had to say that. Sorry. That's for sure. The, the athletic, you want, are you ready for me to move forward? Okay, the athletic staffing, the way that I evaluate that is by looking at your student to teacher ratios at your uh, high schools and your middle schools in the academic areas or your overall ratios and compare them to your student to coach uh, ratios. And y'all were pretty close in that area. There wasn't much, uh, but what I do do is try to look at the discrepancies or the variances within different campuses. And so you have opportunity to convert 12 high school athletic periods to academic periods and six high school academic periods to athletic periods to balance out your ratios. And then at the middle school level was just to convert two middle school athletic periods to academic and five middle school academic periods to athletic. So there was a couple of areas at the middle school that had some high number of students to, uh, or athlete to coach ratios that I felt like that you needed to make sure that you, you take a look at. Okay. The next one is maintenance staff. And here I say consider absorbing up to three maintenance supervisors. The district employs seven compared to the peer district average of 3.2. And so uh, just you could have the opportunity to reduce some maintenance supervisors there. The district employs 0.4 operations staff compared to the peer district average of 0.2 of thousand students. And with that said, Ms. Dr. Tipton, I want to make this known. I thank our maintenance staff because I walk into a school and I don't see a trash can in sight nor trash anywhere. So I want to take this opportunity to thank them. And I know years ago they extended the square footage per maintenance when they hired them at, at the school. So I want to take this opportunity to thank them because our campus, you walk inside and there's not a trash Immaculate. anywhere. Right. It, it, they, and there's not a trash can inside. It's immaculate. So my hat's off to them because they're doing an excellent job. Thank you. So in the evaluation of maintenance workers themselves, uh, you could consider absorbing up to 46 of them. Uh, the district does employ 187 compared to the peer district average of 141. Uh, the district employs 2.4 maintenance staff for 1,000 students compared to the your district average of 1.9. And so there's some opportunity there. You might want to look at the specific trades when determining that, or it could be, you could say, you know, my age of my buildings in my district justify me being staffed at where I am. We keep our buildings well maintained. 
we're not having to build new buildings. So those are all things that have to be considered whenever you're looking at this particular area. And then, as I said earlier, when I began that, remember that the custodial staff, I have pulled those custodians assigned to child nutrition because they're assigned to the campus cafeterias. I have put them in with the custodial staff. They're called custodians. They were just assigned to child nutrition, but you know, other districts have all their custodians doing their whole campus. Not They're not leaving out the child nutrition piece or the cafeteria piece. So I wanna make sure that, that y'all realize that I pulled them out of child nutrition and put them with custodial because that's what their role and responsibility is. But you can consider absorbing up to 72 custodians. The benchmark is one to 19,000. Right now the district is at one for 15,662 cleanable square feet. The deal is y'all staff at a one to 20,000 for custodians, but that does not include the child nutrition custodians. And so that's why when I put those in there, the ratio, you know, it took the ratio down to the 15,662. So just to make sure that you realize what happened right there. Oh, Miss. You do you uh, visit our campuses? I did not walk in campuses. The I do drive by them when I'm in the district, but I typically do not go. I mean, I was at a couple of y'all's facilities just because I uh, did some training there as well. Well, but I did not actually go into each campus physically. Well, one thing I would ask, because uh, this is that's a significant number of custodians that you're talking about. <coughs> and I know you have the ratios, one to 19,000 square feet versus one to, well, we're at 15,660 square feet for one custodian. But you can't compare, uh, you know, uh, schools. Uh, you have a morning okay. side, everything's yes. under one roof compared to a Garza Elementary where you have a bunch of different classrooms, uh, no common hallways. Uh, you know, there are just different types of campuses and that, you know, so uh, you might want to look at that again, you know, and just understand the nature of it. They can give you floor plans, other things like that. You can see that just the logistics of trying to keep the campus clean was going to be different on a campus with uh, a bunch of, uh, let's say, wings that have six classrooms in them, you know, or eight, you know, in one building uh, separated, and there you have six or eight or nine of those on a campus versus one campus that's all under one roof, you know. Right. And so, you know, because you can go to work on those things pretty quickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, before we take th uh, this as the gospel, you know, evaluate it also from that point of view. If you, yeah, you know, because I know that they're not the same. Cleaning Sharp Elementary is going to be very different than cleaning, uh, what was it, a Stillman uh, el uh, Middle School. Cleaning uh, uh, Falk and Stell can be very different than mm -hmm. Stillman or Garcia cause, or Lucio uh, Middle School. The, the buildings are not the same. The older campuses, and we have a lot of older campuses, about 22, 24 mm -hmm. of them. Uh, and and they're going to be a lot more work to clean up and uh, uh, to take care of. But, I, you know, I just yes, say you, you might want to look at it. Yes, all those factors and yeah. we write that in the report. We don't, I mean, it obviously it's not uh, feasible yeah. for us to go visit all the campuses and everything. This is a high level by square footage only. Yeah. Uh, it's not looking at the age of the buildings, the uh, type of maintenance programs that you're on, those types of things. So you've got to consider that when you're establishing your own ratio. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Dr. I said you can get a, have your own maintenance people go ahead. Uh, give us a report on that or something in the future because I think that would be significant. Uh, Dr. Cantu, uh, Miss, I think what oh, Miss Brown first. And then I think what skews the data is what she said though that she added in the the 54. I mean, there's 54 campuses, so you add in 54 of these FNS separate custodians. That's kind of where our numbers get skewed in this whole thing, and I think that's something we need to look at. Um, you're saying that in other districts. They don't separate out their FNS custodians. They're all part of the pot, right? 
Right. Okay. Typically, I mean, I, this is the first district, and I'm, I mean, I've done several of these <laughs> over the last three and a half years, and this is the first district that actually had designated custodians in the child nutrition department. So that's 54 uh, custodians I, right there. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. that's where it's looking kind of, anyway, that's what I think. Dr. Cantu? Thank you, doc, Dr. Tipton. That's exactly what I was going to highlight, um, Ms. Brown, that when we looked at the custodians without the FNS, it's 1 to 20,000 square feet, which we're, are exceeding the, mm -hmm. the minimum standard. It's with the FNS that is, is looking a little differently. So I just want to point out that that's what's skewing the numbers a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So why are we doing that? That's why are my we question. counting our custodians' FNS or regular? What's going on with that? Why are they counting them, or why we have them in FNS? Yeah, why do we have why them why? separated out like that? I, I'm gonna th I'm gonna say this. Uh, I wasn't here because obviously it's been historically probably it's been here for several years. But I'm thinking it has to do with funding because you have the custodians that you can take away from the w general fund, the 199, mm -hmm. and the FNS out of the child nutrition budget. Uh, we're paying them from the child nutrition. So I, I, I think oh, okay. it had to do with uh, funding that you could add that custodian there or put that custodian there and mm -hmm. take it out of FNS funds oh, okay. and, and versus the 199 on the others, the, the regular, the, the rest of the building. But that's what's changing the ratio. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. But so that's the only thing that I can think of that it was done logically in that way to split the funding and put that custodian there. It still takes the square footage away from the rest of the custodians because they take care of that area, the cafeteria, the kitchen area and all of that. So that's what I'm. That's my thinking that they did it that way. And but if I may, when it was done, it, it there's and, and and I noticed that a lot of studies done in this manner, and I and I worry because when this goes out, it goes out as a general study, but little details like that, like side notes, if they could be included in these packets, would explain a lot because that's what one of the things I was thinking of because it's coming from a totally different budget, but you're counting them all together because it doesn't really paint a true photo of what is actually happening. And then if we do something about it and people come and say, oh, well, you didn't say this was part of that, it doesn't give you the, the whole story. And we're in 2020, we're detail. Everything's in the detail. So we can maybe put it somewhere like that on a side note when it goes up on the website and people could understand what's happening. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, we would just need to uh, also uh, possibly look at the square footage that that particular custodian is cleaning versus all the others because we may be increasing everybody else's square footage because they can only clean the cafeteria and the kitchen area where the others are going to have to clean more. And, and if I can ask, I'm glad you brought that up because we need to find out is there certain certification, certain guidelines that the custodians that do the cafeteria because remember dealing with food is way different than cleaning a desk and sweeping up a floor. So that's something that we also have to look at. It's very specific when you clean your kitchen and you clean, let's say, your living room. There's not going to be a lot of food thrown everywhere from that splattered from the sink and the, and the stove. So is there something that they have to get certified and cleared on, which is going to take more time and more tedious to clean that stove and clean that eating area as opposed to vacuuming the carpet in the room? See what I'm saying? Thank you. I, I have a question on... Um regarding the absorption of the 72 custodial positions. So when we go to the exhibit 24 on page 77, um, and we look at all those custodians that are, that are detailed per campus, uh, isn't there any, is there custodians that, that work in the evenings? Yes, ma'am. And are, also, are those also full-time custodians or are those part-time custodians? It's They're all full-time custodians? Mm -hmm. They're all working the eight hours, just some start later and end the day later. Correct. Perhaps it could help us if we know how many campuses, you know, have custodians work. The you evening know, shift. The night shift versus, mm -hmm. you know, the, na the day shift. And that could probably give us a more clear picture about of those 72 custodial positions. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. Okay, the next section is child nutrition. This had very, very little recommendation in, in this area, actually. It just said absorbing possibly two food nutrition services supervisors, uh, similar to the maintenance supervisors. The district is in point five compared to 2.8 for the pure district average. And 
in the area of operation again was 0.4 staff compared to 0.2 per 1,000 students. And then you could consider for the campuses for child nutrition, establishing a mills per labor hour efficiency of 70% or greater. Right now, the mills per labor hour range that we use as benchmarks is 18 for high schools down to, uh, or up to 22 for elementary schools. The district efficiency was 76%, so you were above that 70%. The elementary schools were at 71%, high schools at 85, but you did have several elementary that were below that 70% efficiency. So either look at the number of labor hours that you have at those campuses that were below the 70%, um, or look at a way to increase your uh, participation in your programs. And then looking ahead, this next section is just me breaking down uh, the different areas and showing the cost per area, really just for you to have an idea. Uh, you know, I used your uh, salary data in order to get to these numbers. And so it's just showing you what type of either cost or savings are part of these recommendations. And so this first one was that administrative professional staff group. I'm not going to read out all the different numbers, but you'll see the uh, calculations for the seven instructional uh, technology specialists, the one HR director, uh, absorbing the three assistant principals, absorbing 30 counselors, absorbing 13 librarians, two RNs, uh, and then the total in that area. The next one was the clerical staff. If you absorb the 54 campus clerical and the 82 non-campus clerical. The instructional support staff, the 199 general education aides. Like I said, I'm, I've got the subtraction of the 199 here, but then on the special ed, you'll see me adding in the six, I mean the 60 educational aides. So in teachers, it was the 42 elementary, the seven elective, 25 middle and 82 high school. Special education was the absorption of the one teacher with the addition of the 60 aides, the addition of the nine assessment staff and the addition of the seven speech staff. Maintenance was the three supervisors and the 46 workers. Custodial, the 72 custodians. Child nutrition, the two supervisors. And then all the categories added up for the total. We have a question. One second. So this is really just Miss Karen, we have a question. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just looking in here and I'm looking at your total cost. And these are the the study was done on our 54 campuses only am i correct is this what i'm seeing we didn't do administrative or main office staff and it was everybody everybody's in here all the way yes. to the top because i noticed some of them aren't listed okay no yeah no no but yes no I, yeah but no i'm talking about in here because yes. this one's so much easier this is like in this is in a nutshell yeah yes in the summary we didn't put it in the summary is what i'm saying never mind i got my answer never mind karen i got my answer okay it's not okay. Thank you. And then finally, there's my contact information. Y'all need something from me? Um, have any questions? Or, you know, this is it. It's really, I like I said, options and provide you the information you need in order to plan for your budget for next school year and then years to come because. Typically, you know, you can't implement something like I've made in any recommendation for in a year. It's it's a three to five year period, uh, but it just gives you data as you move forward, setting your guidelines, setting your uh, staffing ratios you want for your district, and it helps you see uh, what can be accomplished uh, through the recommendations as well. Oh, okay. Quick question, real quick. Oh. And, and we were compared to another district, let's say, that has 54 campuses. In other words, the same size district you're comparing with our district. That's correct. Are we coming up with these findings? It's in the book. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, under, I understand. It's a question that was asked. So I want to just say that. Please forgive me. Am I upset you for that? 
But my question is, we are, I was asked, I was, I was asked, it's being compared to a district the same size as ours. Am I correct? Because not exactly. everybody has this book. That's correct. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that with them. That's all. I yeah, apologize. If your peer districts are listed yes. at the beginning Somebody of the asked report, me that. and you'll see their size with their enrollment. Yes, they I were compared that. to twelve other schools. Yes, thank you. I was asked, and I and I, I wanted you to say it so they can Ma verify Chair. that it is true. First, Ms. Brown, can she Ms. Chair, our hand up first. Yes. Okay. But so so basically, Karen, what you're saying is, if we were to implement absorb the positions you're recommending and uh, make the expenditures on special ed, more or less this district would save $20 million. Yes. Okay. I mean, not that that's going to happen that way, but if we were to implement what you're recommending right now, it would be a savings of $20 million. Okay. Uh, Mr. Powell? Just a question. On page six of your uh, review, uh, report uh, you're showing Brownsville as having 7487 students or I mean t a staff uh, we're not we're much lower than that right now uh, are you basing this report on our current numbers rather than because th you're, you're just looking at uh, sizes of districts a while back um, we I'm gonna go to uh, let's see I'm gonna open report here so be, be on the same page with you you'll just bear with me let me get to your report Let's see your final okay it's nice to be on the report with you now okay you're on page six you're on page six you have a comparison districts and you okay Yes, if you'll look at those, that's enrollment numbers. If you are looking at, at yourself and saying 42,992 and you're not quite at that number, those were the FTE, or that was the enrollment that was reported in the HR services salary survey for this year mm -hmm. by y'all's district. And so that's not a PEANS number or anything. That's just the number that somebody took an estimate. And that happens at the very beginning of the year. Okay. so. But your report actually uh, that's just to go ahead and compare us with other districts about our size and that's what you use that for is that correct yes yes okay. whenever I was but I your was but the information that you that you use is actually what we are now where we are at now is that correct yes because I got your okay. you know I take student enrollment numbers by campus you know the district the the campuses report their enrollment to me and then that's what I use throughout the okay. report. That, that, that answers my, that was my concern. I, you know, okay. Yes. That, so we're not okay. looking at old numbers. We're actually looking at what we are, where we are right now, you know. Right, okay. whenever you look at the different uh, comparisons to benchmarks. Now on the peer comparisons, you're still gonna see that 42,992 because that was built, that's in the system because that's what y'all reported at the time of the data central, you know, salary survey. And so, Make sure that you know that if you're looking at a chart that has to, that is the HR services salary survey, it's going to reflect that 42,992. But when you get into the campus staffing and you look at your enrollment for secondary at 22,280, that's based on the actual enrollment at the time that I collected the data okay. in the, that was in uh, January. Okay. Well, thank you. That, that January. reassures me that we're living with what dealing with what we have now. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I just wanted to to add um, on the I'm I'm looking at the cost increase in savings, but I think you know there's some um, I would just recommend to administration perhaps there's some positions such as librarians, you know, that we just can't sac sacrifice for the school community for the kids, you know, to to share. And so that's just one of, you know, one of my concerns. And I think that we had talked about that, you know, before that I think within the school community, you know, they need their nurse and they need their, their librarian. So I was just concerned about that. And the other item that I wanted to touch on is, <coughs> I'm going back to the actual councils because I know that, that uh, you know, that was a, a little shock to me, you know, to see the absorption of, of the 27 counselors. But um, I know that the ratio for the one to three fifty that's based on the Texas Counseling Association, but I do know yes. that r correct. Okay, so I think those kind of side notes will help us. But um, but 
you know, being that we're at, you know, our students are, you know, have a high risk, uh, we have a high mm -hmm. risk population. And um, the American School Counseling Association has our, the ratio at 350 to 1. So, you know, so maybe that's just something to, to consider, d you know, because of our at risk population. Yes, and I, I think now we get an overview of, uh, of the staffing of, of the district, but uh, so it's just going to be, like I said earlier, about balancing better as we move on and looking at everything carefully for the next three years. Because remember that if staff is, if we overstaff, it impacts salaries also. You can't have them both high. You cannot be overstaffed and have high salaries and think it's fine. If we're overstaffed, it, it compresses the salaries down. So what we, not, what we need to do is adequately staff to compensate better for the rest. And that's going to be my challenge, our challenge to, to do that uh, within the next uh, three years of moving on where we can do a better balance of bringing the salaries up and the overstaffing down. Of course, nobody loses their job, but we also want to see how little by little we can face in a, a better pay for our employees to be more at market. It's just a balancing act between the two. But both of them cannot be high. There's no way. Ms. Brown? Well, as someone who pushed for us to have a TASB study, and I know several of the other board members as well, this gives us concrete information so that when we're deliberating things and when you're making recommendations, we really are working from some real facts, some real data, some real understanding of where we stand as a district. And these things have developed over many years. It was a different scenario many years ago. It's hard to second guess previous administrations and why they did what they did. We've lost students, it's different times, and obviously we're all sitting here with masks right now going through something that we've never gone through before. That's gonna impact us, it is. So it's good to have some good numbers from someone who knows what they're doing to tell us where we stand when in comparison to all the other districts across the state. So some of these numbers are a little scary, but at least it's, a, it's concrete facts that we can use, and I like that. Mr. Cohen? Yeah, and Doctor, uh, I mean, it's important that you essentially set up a process to implement th these recommendations uh, because they will impact our budget in the future if we do nothing. And there was one district here where they got down to nothing in their fund balance. And I think they even had to go out and borrow to cover the shortfall. And then they had to go through a riff and some other stuff, you know, because people didn't follow through. This is given to us uh, in a way to preserve the uh, financial strength of the district uh, so that, uh, you know, we c can survive whatever happens. And especially the next biennium, you know, which we may not be looking at an increase, we may be looking at a decrease in funding. Uh, the biggest reason is the price of oil. You know, it's just, uh, I mean, the state relies a great deal on that. And uh, what was it? But, uh, uh, you know, you're, you have your work cut out for you, and we'll be waiting for your recommendations. Thank you. Ms. Pena. Uh, and thank you. And, and I want to thank you for stressing out that you said it's not something you're going to run out and do tomorrow or the next year. It's going to take time. And the majority of the things that we do is by reassignment or attrition because your objective is to make this work, not to go and cut jobs or, or put a panic because if you put a panic in administration, you put a panic in teachers, then the panic rolls down to the students. And that's where you get your outcome. So I'm, I, I appreciate that that's not the way you're thinking. You're thinking how to do it in a responsible uh, fiduciary manner to be able to do what we're doing, keep everybody working, and making sure that we stay within the budget and we don't end up like some districts who had a shortfall. So I appreciate those thoughts, and I, uh, I appreciate that you will stress that to our employees, because what we got to do is to make sure we keep your job, put you where we need you so we can keep going, and not have to one day hand out pink slips. We pray that never happens. So thank you for that. Mr. Garcia. And once again, uh, thank you. It was a great presentation. I got to learn a lot about, you know, positions and all this, and one good message that people need not be afraid once again that nobody is going to lose their job here um, so do not be afraid no one is losing their jobs we're going to move forward together thank you very much great presentation
-hmm. Just thank you. I think it's a really good. It hel it always uh, helps us to know where we are, so we can know where we need to be and what it is that we can do to to reach our goals and to stay to have a balanced budget, to increase salaries if it's something that we can do. If we're uh, proactive in in doing this, you know, I think that's important as well. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Gutierrez. His at the administration. Thank you for a great presentation, Ms. Karen Dooley, thank you very much <laughs> for, your, for your presentation. It was a pleasure working with you. I enjoyed it. Yes, I think this staffing patterns report is really a step forward, you know, for the district to be able to make some good informed decisions when we're adopting our new budget for the new school year. So thank you. I think. Thank you. And the next steps. Next steps. Um, we are now uh, going to Okay, we're going into, uh, I thought I heard myself, but it, it's, um, now we're going to go into budget uh, num workshop number three, and uh, we're hoping to have it maybe next Thursday, because uh, we need to move pretty quick as we're moving on uh, in the month of May and, and June so that we can finalize it. So it's, uh, we'll get back with you, and I'll talk to uh, Dr. Tipton and, and, uh, and set up a uh, Hopefully it will be Thursday of next week and, and, and the time, and that way we'll let you know, and that way we can start presenting the budget uh, actual numbers with uh, both the staffing study and the salary study uh, taken into account for that uh, first budget, wor uh, well, third budget workshop, but now giving you the numbers, uh, how they look like, how we look like for next year. Mr. Garcia? Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on the next step? Next item, public comment, public comment period has been suspended. This decision is based on the evolving COVID-19 public health threat. Yeah. And I think this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.